pleasure to have you here. Thanks, uh, Dr. Crew. And uh, first of all, good morning to those of you who are one in 10, 10 minutes behind. It's actually good afternoon now. So uh, I'm just, let me just say thank you to you, your team uh, here at Medgar Evers College. I certainly want to thank the National Urban League staff team. Uh, I want to recognize uh, Leonard Jones, who is the treasurer of the board of the New York Urban League. And the New York Urban League, of course, is the Urban League affiliate that serves New York City. We at the National Urban League have our offices here in New York, but we have uh, 94 affiliate offices all across the nation. So we are, uh, we're in Seattle, we're in Chicago, we're in Boston, we're in New Orleans, we're in Atlanta. We are everywhere trying to help uh, empower communities and change lives. So thank you for having me and a warm, warm thanks to you for your leadership, not, not only here at Medgar, but your distinguished career. So I'm glad to be here. Y'all wanna talk state of black America? You wanna make it real? All right, let's get real. If you would, I know you've got some particular uh, interest in a number of the slides that you wanted to actually uh, use as a point of reference. So why don't yeah, you start yeah. there? So let me just start by saying this. This report, the state of black America, is available to each and every one of you uh, here in this auditorium. Because this year, it's a digital uh, report. And by that I mean we have a website at stateofblackamerica.org that has a lot of great information. Uh, but you can also download the full report. And we certainly want to encourage you all to access it or download it because what I do know is that we went through a lot of information, a lot of data, statistical information, uh, and certain pieces of it uh, might be important to you, other pieces may not be as important to you, but we certainly, uh, absolutely, uh, will uh, uh, want you to know. We uh, uh, are focusing this year on jobs, education, and justice. And you know that while we may separate them for the purposes of discussion and analysis, these issues work together. The challenges we face, uh, challenges in education, uh, and sometimes poor schools or underperforming schools lead to difficulty uh, in getting a job. Difficult social and economic conditions lead to justice challenges in many, many communities. Uh, it's uh, not a coincidence that many of the challenges we face in the relationship between police uh, and communities occur more decidedly in poor neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, in America. These issues work together and they affect us together. But we're focusing this year on those three issues. And what this report, the State of Black America, really, really says this year is that this is a tale of two nations. A tale of two nations. And when you look at the conditions, you have uh, black America, you have brown America, that from a statistical standpoint, are very, very similar. Uh, white America, of course, doing better. Uh, I want to say, however, that the recession we went through, Dr. Crew, in, in 2007, Seven. 8, 9, and into 10, affected the whole nation, drove up the unemployment rates, uh, decreased the home ownership rates across the board, created uh, you know, millions of job losses. However, for the black community and the Latino community, the effects were even more dramatic. And when we look at the challenges we face today, uh, it points to that picture. Now, we always want to talk about good news and challenges. So we've got to highlight some good news. So you see it on the slide, a couple of important things. Actually, high school graduation rates are up. Mm -hmm. High school dropout rates are down. Give yourselves a hand on that. And even though we know about all the challenges uh, in affordability in higher ed, uh, the number of black students today attending and participating in higher ed, colleges, universities, and career colleges is at an all-time high. Give yourselves another big hand. Stick with it. Stay with it. It's a good, positive thing. On the economic front, 
uh, we have had the strongest period of private sector job creation since, Dr. Crew, you remember this, the peanut farmer from Georgia, James yeah. Earl Carter, was president. Right. That's way back in 1977. So this period of job growth, the last 12 months, is the strongest continuous period of job growth since Jimmy Carter was president in 1977. Uh, we also uh, can say, uh, and the numbers tell these stories. I mean, this is not the Urban League's opinion. This is just facts. These are statistics. And I'm going to add context around it because, as I said, before I share with you crisis and challenge, we need to understand what arrows may be pointing in the right direction. Uh, so this is a, a balanced conversation. Not all good, not all bad, but absolutely accurate in terms of what the numbers show. There's a lot of conversation out there about the President's Affordable Care Act. Uh, it, it's so interesting that there was a fella who announced for President threatening to repeal the Affordable Care Act, come to find out he signed up for it. <laughs> so, so much for being honest and having integrity in your positions. But the Affordable Care Act, lovingly called by some as, as Obamacare, has actually narrowed health disparities in this country because now there's 16.4 million more people who have health insurance. And we should give the Affordable Care Act a hand because it is beginning, beginning, I'm putting beginning, to indeed make a difference and the numbers and the statistics show that. Now, here's another side of this story. And it's the crisis side. And the crisis side is a crisis around jobs. It's a crisis around justice. And it's a crisis around education. So let me take justice. Because justice issues were in the news, not only in New York City, but around the nation in 2014, and even 13, beginning with Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Akai Gurley right here in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, Eric Garner in Staten Island. And there are many, many instances of unarmed black men uh, being shot by the police. And in the case of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown and Eric Garner, no justice. No one held accountable. In the case of Akai Gurley, this new district attorney here in Brooklyn, Ken Thompson, did secure an indictment. And I want to give Ken Thompson a hand for giving us confidence that the criminal justice system can work in a fair and equitable way. Uh, so justice issues have been at the forefront. Another justice issue that's been at the forefront has been voting. Uh, as we speak, the Nevada State Legislature is yet another state which is on the verge of passing new legislation to require people to have a certain type of photo ID in order to be able to vote. So the last five years, there have been 40 states, that's 80% of the states, Dr. Crew, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, who have sought to pass new ways to make it more difficult for people to vote by requiring IDs of a certain type, by cutting back on early voting, by making it more difficult for students to vote by eliminating in Texas the use of a student ID as a legitimate form of identification. Something is amiss uh, when all of these states are trying to make it more difficult in a democracy that is engaged in wars abroad to help other nations create democracy, some right here in this nation are trying to make it more difficult for people to access the ballot box 
and the Supreme Court of the United States two years ago uh, declared an important part of the Voting Rights Act unconstitutional. The Voting Rights Act that the man for whom this school is named, Medgar Evers, fought for, and one of the things he worked for, and one of the things he lost his life for. That bill, that act, that uh, Voting Rights Act that had been declared constitutional by the Supreme Court time and time again, this Supreme Court decided by 5-4 vote was unconstitutional. Justice is being challenged. And then let me talk about jobs. Jobs, which I know for every college student, many of you work already. Uh, every one of you is looking forward to a career of your choice so you can earn what you need to earn to have a good quality of life. We've got a big challenge when it comes to jobs. Behind me, it shows those cities in America that have the highest black unemployment rates. So what we're facing today, now this is today, five years in to the recovery. While all these jobs are being created, you still have 33, 33 of the 70 largest cities that have unemployment rates exceeding 15%. And you have seven of these cities where the unemployment rate exceeds 20%. Now what does that mean? If you go to unemployment rates in the black community in the 20% range, those are the highest unemployment rates that many of these cities have seen since they have been keeping the numbers. This is one out of five who are looking for a job, who are unemployed. This is a crisis of significant dimensions. I put the New York number, if you can see it, down at the bottom, because I want everyone to focus here on how New York is doing. So New York currently has a black unemployment rate of 14%. Uh, doesn't quite make the 15% highest threshold, but still a significant unemployment rate in the black community. In the Latino community, the unemployment rate is lower at 10, but still in double digits. The white rate is down at 6.7%. So even in New York, the white rate is higher than the national average. So amidst growth uh, and development which is taking place in this community and in this city, uh, it is to some extent bypassing uh, large portions of the black and Latino communities. And that's why we need to be able, as we have conversations, not only here at Medgar, but in the community, in the media, with politicians, elected officials, uh, to have the conversation and to understand what the situation really is, what the facts indeed show. So the unemployment crisis is a crisis that really concerns the National Urban League. And it concerns us because we are in the job training business. We are in the job placement business. Uh, and we think that plays a big role in helping people. But this unemployment problem that we face is also different, unique, because traditionally, when you've had an economic downturn and then you have a comeback, uh, the comeback reaches all communities. In this case, this comeback is bypassing large portions of the community. So the recession is still alive and well in many neighborhoods, inner city neighborhoods across America today. Now, there's the concept of unemployment and jobs when we talk about economics. And then there are two other things called income and wealth. Income and wealth. Income 
and wealth. And I'm repeating it because we want to understand the difference. And again, let's look at what these numbers show. So the income differential between blacks, whites, and Latinos is uh, a significant. Uh, and this is median income. Half the people have income below this number. Half the people have income above this number. Median income for African Americans, 34. Whites, 41. And Hispanics, 41. Whites, I believe it's 57,000. So there's a differential here. Uh, and it's a big difference uh, in your quality of life between making $34,000 and making $57,000. So this differential is a differential that we've seen consistently, Dr. Krug, uh, over the last uh, decade or so. However, let's look at wealth. Wealth is an important measure. You look at what you own versus what you owe. What you own versus what you owe. It's simple arithmetic. What you own versus what you owe. And that's called net worth. The net worth differential, which is the wealth differential in this country, is wide between blacks and whites, between Latinos and whites, significant. This differential has, uh, for the most part, remained large for a long time. But the recession cost a lot of people their homes. In the black community, it really, really had a devastating effect on the home ownership rate, probably taking it down 8% or so. This wealth, so when we talk about things we've got to do to strengthen the community, to build the community, to close the disparities, we've got to keep our eyes on unemployment, which certainly drives income, and we've also got to keep our eyes on wealth. Now, this nation. Also, this is a racial lens on the income disparity issue. But regardless of race in this country, there are wide gaps that have emerged between what I, what I call the top 10% and the remaining 90. And that, uh, over the last 20 to 30 years, those in the top 10% have seen their incomes rise very fast. Those in the bottom 90 have not seen their income rise much at all uh, in real dollar terms. So this is a lot of important information. Uh, every, almost every state in the nation has an achievement gap between blacks, whites, uh, and Latinos. And you can go and look at this, this education equality gap uh, to get your arms around, indeed, how large it is on a state-by-state -state basis. I think it's instructive, and I think it helps. But here's the kicker. The kicker is, is that we also, Dr. Crew, uh, participated in the release of a companion report uh, by the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan. And what it shows is that most states in the United States spend more per pupil on wealthy students in wealthy school districts than they spend on poorer school districts. We have work to do. These disparities are real. This is not meant to be a downer. This is not meant for people to walk out and say, boy, that's some tough information. This is meant to be an inspiration. It's meant to be a wake up call. It's meant to be a guidepost about the important work uh, that we need to do as a nation. And what uh, all the students, as students, you are not only going to be uh, graduates of Medgar Evers College who go into the workforce, you're going to be future leaders. You're going to be community leaders. You're going to be civic leaders. Uh, you're going to be people on the front lines leading uh, institutions and organizations. You're going to be at the forefront of, uh, of voting and civic engagement. We have to understand what we want this nation to be, 
what are the difficult issues for the nation to confront uh, in the 21st century. So ready to have a conversation, get the report, take a look at the report. It's a great report uh, and, and, and hopefully it will be uh, and lead to further discussions and further conversations. And the final thing is, we made recommendations in the report about things that need to be done. I'm just going to cite one or two. We need to raise the minimum wage in all 50 states to a living wage. We need to basically say that we have to create respect for people who work. And we have additional recommendations, but in the interest of uh, going on with the conversation, uh, thank you. First of all, because it just warrants it. Thank you. Thank you.